This lecture, every year, the National Biography Award Lecture, is a very popular and respected contribution to discussions relating to the writing forms of biography and autobiography. And it's associated with the National Biography Award, which is a literary competition organized by the State Library of New South Wales, but sponsored by its very generous benefactors, Mr. Michael Crouch, AO, and Mr. Jeffrey Kames. I would like to acknowledge and thank them publicly for their passion and support for this award. Thank you. <laughs> entries for this year's award competition have just closed, and it's again a record year for entries, with over 60 titles submit submitted. Yes. <laughs> um, and tonight we welcome a very special guest speaker, Mr. Ray Gaeta, the professor of moral philosophy at King's College London. Ray is internationally renowned for his work in the field of philosophy. In addition to this, he's spoken and published widely on several issues, which include the role of moral considerations in politics and the place of collective responsibility in society. His publications include A Common Humanity, Thinking About Love, and Truth and Justice, Good and Evil, An Absolute Conception. Ray's book, Romulus, My Father, is widely known and respected, winning many awards, including the National Biography Award in 1999. It was made into a beautiful film, which I'm sure many of you have seen. So we're very lucky to have him here this evening. And please join me now in welcoming Ray to the podium to deliver his lecture tonight on truth as applied to biography and autobiography. Well, thank you. Um, I'm very honored uh, to be here, uh, especially uh, since I've had so many distinct... Can you hear me okay? Uh, since I've had so many uh, distinguished predecessors. Well, it, uh, a quicker title for this lecture would be, Was He Really Like That? <laughs> <laughs> uh, truth uh, and Biography. You ask, uh, it's a bit long, I'm afraid, it goes for a, a full hour. Uh, you ask who he was, let me answer in the time-honoured fashion and tell you a story. <coughs> In those words, Isaac Dinesen, uh, also known as Karen Blixen, the author of uh, Out of Africa, in those words, Karen Blixen expressed a conception of narrative identity. She assumed, of course, that the question was not incorrigibly naive because it assumed something that would count as an answer, when in principle nothing could. That would hardly be worth saying were it not for the fact that we now think we're so sophisticated about truth objectivity and meaning, that we wonder whether there is such a thing as what who someone really is. I think if such scepticism were justified, then writing and reading biography would make no sense, or if it did, sense so ironic as to be barely recognisable. Many people, however, do profess just such a scepticism. There now exists a huge literature on biography and autobiography and on narrative more generally, but I'm afraid that my knowledge of it is not at all impressive. And I hope, therefore, you'll excuse me for speaking personally about a book I wrote, Romulus, My Father, and about what I took myself to be doing when I tried to write it truthfully. Doing so will enable me to speak less abstractly uh, from the coalface, as it were, about some of the implications of a robust and serious conception of narrative truth. And to begin with, I want to outline, uh, or just sketch, uh, the story that I told uh, as it bears uh, on my theme tonight. My father was born in 1922 in a Romanian-speaking part of Yugoslavia, and when he was 13, he fled his home and trained to become a blacksmith. Just before World War II broke out, he went to Germany, where he believed he could best practice his trade. Trapped there by the war, he met and fell in love with my mother, Christine, at the time a girl of 16. And after the war, they emigrated in 1950 to Australia because they had been wrongly advised that the climate would relieve, if not actually cure, her severe asthma. They came to Melbourne, which was one of the worst places in the world, <laughs> I gather, for asthma. 
Already on board ship and later in a migrant's reception camp uh, in northern Victoria, my mother had affairs with other men, in part at least because she was already suffering from a form of mental illness, manic depression, of which promiscuity uh, is often a symptom. And because my father was told that I was running wild, he called for me to live with him in a migrant workers camp in central Victoria, where he was working on a project to build a reservoir. And there he met and befriended two brothers, Pantelimon and Mitchell Hora. Pantelimon, whom I just call Hora, as my father always did, became my father's dearest friend and a second father to me. Mitru, of whom I was also very fond, became my mother's lover and the father of my two half-sisters. He and my mother had a desperate relationship, which ended in his suicide in a small Victorian town in 1956 at the age of 27. Two years later, my mother killed herself on the eve of her 30th birthday. My father and I lived for 10 years together in Frogmore, a derelict farmhouse in central Victoria. It had no electricity or running water, and for all the time we lived there, we cooked on a one-burner kerosene stove and read by the light of a kerosene lamp. And most of the dramatic incidents of the book, and also of the film, I might say, not well in the case of the film, all of the dramatic incidents, uh, occurred when we lived there at Frogmore. And of those, the most harrowing for me was my father's descent into insanity. I'm quite sure that the way people have been moved by the story that I told in Romulus is a function of the fact that they trust that I've tried to tell it truthfully and that it is truthful. The integrity of the book depends on it, I think. I refuse, for example, to include more direct speech than I could remember or was recorded by others. I refuse to invent it, even if it could reasonably said, be, have been said to be truthful to the spirit of the book. Of course, that doesn't guarantee that the words on the page are actually those that were spoken. Nonetheless, that I conceived of the book as requiring that degree and kind of truthfulness shows, I think, in its tone, and it's why people would lose interest if they discovered I'd made things up. I don't have a general view about truth and truthfulness in biography. Drusilla Majeska, an award-winning Sydney writer, wrote a memoir about her mother, it's called Poppy, which included a fictitious diary that she attributed to her mother. Some people mind, others don't. I don't. But Jessica said that she included the diary in the spirit of being true to, indeed of deepening the truthfulness of her biography. There's little to be said, I think, about the thought, or if somebody says there's little to be said for believing, that when she said that, she must have said something that was a contradiction in terms. But in the case of Romulus, readers who've been moved by it want to be assured, I think, that my father was as I described him. That, um, now this is a phrase in inverted commas, this is how he really was. In a sense of that phrase, inconsistent with the inclusion of fictitious material. Why is that? If a reader's trust that Majeska described her mother as she was, should not necessarily be undermined by the revelation that the diary is fictitious, why is it so different with Romulus? Part of the answer, I think, lies in the fact that the book is a form of witness to the way my father lived his values and to the values themselves. And the integrity of witness seldom, if ever, survives invention, even invention sincerely included in order to make characters more vivid, dramatically more real. Readers must believe that my mother did fail to care for me, that my father did look after me, that Mitra did kill himself at the age of 27, that my mother did the same at the age of 29. And even I suspect that Jack, our wayward cockatoo, did walk half a kilometre to Tom Lilly's farm after my father had clipped his wing. Truth as I've just been speaking of it is for the most part truth about the facts. And now I just mean an ordinary workaday sense of facts that a judge, for example, might appeal to when he says to an emotional witness or to one given to literary flourishes, stick to the facts, please. Did Jack walk to Lily's farm? Did my father sometimes pay the rent for, my fa for Mitra and my mother? 
These are questions about facts. But of course the book is not a chronicle of facts of that kind. When readers ask, was Romulus Gator really like that? The phrase really like that invokes a more complicated and difficult notions of truth and reality connected with the meaning, the significance of those facts. And to be truthful merely about the facts, I relied on the usual sorts of things, memory, memory corroborated by the memory of others, documents, letters, and so on. To be truthful about their meaning, which was by far the more difficult and important, I listened almost every evening to Bach. I depended on him to keep me truthful. And when I returned to my writing tablet table in the morning, I hoped that it would show. Writing about things that affected me profoundly, my mother's suicide, my father's madness, for example, I had to resist as much as possible all dispositions to pathos or to sentimentality. And that's not merely a personal remark. Anybody in similar circumstances should do the same. But in resisting these, I wasn't trying to get feeling out of the writing. I don't think anybody who's read Romulus would say that it's lacking in feeling. I was trying to make the feeling true, but I don't mean by that that I wanted to be sincere. Sentimentality is sincere more often than not. In resisting sentimentality, I wasn't so much trying to feel right, but trying to see things right, to understand things right. I could find no better way of putting this than to say I was trying to see things as they were, rather than how, succumbing to various common human failings, they were constantly appearing to me. And what else are efforts to see things as they are rather than as they appear because one wishes them to appear thus or because one's perspective is limited or because one's judgment is distorted by, for example, vanity or sentimentality or because one is tone deaf to irony and so on. What is it to try to make efforts in this direction if not efforts towards truth? I think it's a mistake to think of a disposition to sentimentality or to pathos, for example, as psychological states that sometimes merely disable proper cognitive function. Instead of thinking of the dispositions, these kinds of dispositions, as causes, as psychological causes of falsehood, one should think of them, I believe, as forms of falsehood. And whether I succeeded in portraying the people I wrote about as they were, rather than as for many reasons I wish them to appear to me, is of course for readers to judge. But I'm certain that in trying to do that, I wasn't engaged in an enterprise that is of its nature, intrinsically, rather than on account of common human failings, entirely illusory. Concepts like sentimentality, bathos and so on, are critical concepts. They're concepts to which understanding, not just feeling, is answerable. And they mark, I believe, a distinctive realm of understanding with notions of truth, truthfulness and objectivity appropriate to them. One shouldn't assimilate the many ways we speak of truth and objectivity to one paradigm of truth and objectivity, a factual one or a scientific one, for example. In this conceptual domain, biographical or autobiographical writing, there is such a thing, I really believe, as the effort to see things as they are, rather than as one would wish them to be, or as one fantasizes them to be, or as they would appear from this or that narrow perspective. And it's marked as such by a range of critical concept, concepts that tell us when we're thinking well and when we're thinking badly. It's a range far more extensive than those to which factual thought is answerable, and it sustains a conception of the impersonal that's different from the impersonality of thought about facts or about science. It's a kind of impersonality that's achieved when we've submitted to the disciplines with which we try to rid our thought of banality, of second-hand opinion, of cliché, of sentimentality, of our vulnerability to pathos, and so on. And if we accept that, I can see no reason why we should not accept that such efforts to see things as they are, are efforts oriented to truth. 
But then one could put the point the other way about, a way perhaps more congenial to those who fear the talk of truth almost always disguises an inclination to reach for a capital T. To try, when writing biography or autobiography, to be truthful, to orient one's efforts towards truth, just is to make one's efforts answerable to those critical concepts whose application is interdependent with a distinctive but robust conception of trying to see things as they are. If Denison is right, that it's the distinctive achievement, even if it's not the distinctive task of biography, to reveal truthfully a person's individuated presence <coughs> in the world, the presence of someone who has, in Kierkegaard's words, lived her own life and nobody else's, how then is that to be achieved? Only, I think, by trying to be truthful in one's characterization of the meaning of what the biographical subjects do and suffer. And unless we thought that by revealing the meaning of their individuated responsiveness to the big facts of human life, unless we thought that in doing that, we could disclose the distinctive identity of a biographical subject, we wouldn't write biographies or autobiographies, I think. Though we tell stories about animals, we don't write their biographies because, as a philosopher Rush Rees once pointed out, it makes no sense to speak of an animal taking the wrong turning in life, facing life honestly without consoling fantasies, despairing of life or rejoicing in life or cursing the day that it was born. So return now to Denison's remark, you ask who he was. And <clears throat> if someone were standing at my father's grave and were to ask that question, then I hope that my book, Romulus, My Father, would answer it. It would do that, however, only if he were confident, that is, if the person who's asking the question were confident, that Romulus was as he was depicted in the book. Denison's insight depends, therefore, the sense of it depends, on its making sense for us to ask, was so-and-so, the subject of a biography or an autobiography, really like that? And if that question could always justifiably be dismissed as naive, because nothing could even in principle count as an answer to it, because there's no such thing as what it is really to be, say Romulus Gator, no such thing as how Romulus Gator really was that could make true a claim about how he really was, then I'm sure, as I said before, people would not bother to read biography or autobiography. And that inclines me to conclude that the indisputable fact that every life can be interpreted in many ways, that, that, that there are essentially many, rather merely contingently many, perspectives on a life, should not make one dismissive of our abiding interest in what people are really like. I wouldn't, however, like you to think that I believe this matter is simple. Indeed, I want now to explore some of its complexities. The complexity is a perspective which you'll see that his perspective is not just a matter of how one characterises the psychological complexity, which inevitably belongs to any biographical subject, but also is a matter of how one characterises the values by which they live. Earlier I said that my father's descent into madness was, uh, not, was the most dramatic of the events that had occurred in my childhood at Frogmore. It wasn't the first time, though, that I'd encountered mental illness. My mother, as I said, suffered from it and in her despair took her own life on the eve of her 30th birthday, only two years after Mitra, her lover, took his. I'd also been acquainted with a gentler form of madness in the person of Vatsek Vilkovikas. Like my father, Vatsek had come to Australia on an assisted passage which required him to work for two years in repayment. We met him in a migrant workers' camp in central Victoria, to which he'd been sent as my father had to build the reservoir that I mentioned earlier. Soon after work was finished on the reservoir, Vatsek lost his mind, and he went to live between two large granite boulders on the side of a small mountain some 15 kilometres from where my father and I lived. And to protect him from the weather, he covered the boulders with whatever he could find, and there he lived, contented, 
I believe, for some years until times became less tolerant and he was taken forcibly to a psychiatric hospital. Near to the boulders where he slept, he built a small tin shed. I don't know why he didn't sleep in it. And there he kept various concoctions that he pickled, often in his urine. Visibly insane, he talked to himself, though never with the aggressive guttural explosions that mark some forms of insanity. He spoke as gently to himself as he did to others, sometimes barely audibly, furrowing his brow, and when he asked himself a question or extending, he, or extending his arm, palm upwards to express helplessness or resignation. And sometimes he stayed with us in Frogmore. It's perhaps not surprising, therefore, that at the end of my schooling, I developed an interest in psychology, first as an empirical discipline and later uh, philosophically because of the many conceptual issues it raises. And it's an interest that continues to this day. Yet when I wrote Romulus, I deliberately avoided anything that looked like theoretical descriptions and concepts, even to the point of refusing to give a name to my mother's illness. I did this because I wanted to convey, in ways not obscured or softened by theory, the full terribleness and the full terror of madness, while not diminishing the dignity of those who suffer it. The terror that I often saw in my father's eyes expressed his faltering realisation that a mind that has been at least partially lost to madness can't assure itself that it's sane. He knew he couldn't trust the efforts he made to face his affliction with lucidity or even with courage, as he would have if he'd been told that he had a fatal illness. For what is courage or any other virtue if nothing counts as seriously trying to become lucid about the difference between its real and its counterfeit forms. Courage as opposed to uh, a bloody-minded stubbornness, for example, or opposed to recklessness. My father understood the terror of mental illness long before he fell victim to it. The time when he conveyed this to me is amongst the most vivid of my childhood memories, and this is how I record it in Romulus. I'm quoting now. I've seldom seen such affliction as I saw my father suffer in those last years in Frogmore, and I only saw it again when I worked as a student in a psychiatric hospital. He understood it before he became its victim. Some years before, while we were travelling on the motorbike, he talked about Vatsek and said, there's no sickness worse than mental sickness. I remember his words clearly. I remember the exact point where we were on the road. Most of all, I remember his strong, bare, sun-darkened arms on either side of me as I sat on the petrol tank. For me to remember his words and our surroundings so vividly, the authority with which he spoke them must have impressed me deeply. The sight of his muscular arms protected me against their terrible meaning. End of quote. Now, more than 40 years after my mother killed herself and my father went insane, we make efforts to ensure that those who suffer mental illness are accepted with respect into the community. We're encouraged to see unnerving behaviour as symptoms of an illness, of a disease even, like any other illness. We're encouraged to learn the names of those illnesses. And in keeping with the spirit of the times, some of the names have been changed. Manic depression to bipolar disorder, for example, because the former sounds too much like a form of madness. Sometimes silly things are said and done in the service to the ideal that people who are mentally ill should be treated as fully our fellow human beings. But if one sees the wood for the trees, one will, I think, judge that efforts to realise that ideal have on the whole been admirable. admirable. Nonetheless, there's a danger that such efforts will unintentionally diminish our sensitivity to the terror that the word madness conveys much better than the more clinical expressions and it will also diminish our capacity to realise how astonishing it is to respond with our condescension to those who are seriously mad. Lear's cry, Oh, let me not be mad, not mad, sweet heaven, keep me in temper, I would not be mad, is heart-rending, but not because he suffered what we now call social stigma. And his cry wouldn't move us as it does had he said, Oh, let me not fall into bipolar disorder. <laughs> That's why, when I wrote Romulus, 
I wanted the reader's response to be unmediated by theory, just as my father's response to his illness, and quite differently his response to Vatsik and to my mother, had been. He responded to them without a trace of condescension. And more than anything else, I think, that is the reason I wrote Romulus, to celebrate or to bear a kind of witness for that. Romulus, my father, is now on lists in schools uh, in Victoria and here in New South Wales. And when I reflect on the many emails I receive about the book, I'm struck by the fact that people praise my father's integrity, his courage in the face of much misfortune, his sense of honour and his nobility. And if they say that he was a good man, then they usually explain what they mean by saying that he possessed those virtues to an exemplary degree. I'm not sure, but if he possessed only those virtues, important though they are, I don't think I would have written the book. I wrote it to celebrate his goodness, as that showed in his behaviour towards Vatsek and towards my mother and Mitchell. And I'll discuss this at some length because it will require me to enter a very important qualification on my remark that I hope that Romulus, my father, the book, would truthfully answer someone who asks, who was this man, Romulus Gator? What kind of man was he? First, I'll talk about Vatsek. After I'd written Romulus, my father, a journalist asked me whether Vatsek had seemed weird to me when I was a boy. I answered sincerely that I hadn't. And later I was, I was puzzled by why I hadn't. Objectively, after all, he was very strange. And the answer that came to me was that my father and Hora behaved towards Vatsek without condescension. And had they condescended to him, had it shown in their tone of voice or demeanour, in their body language, as we often say, the cruel sensitivity that children often possess would have made me conclude that Vatsek was not entirely one of us. As it was, the contrary was true. Their treatment of Vatsek enabled me to see him, his strange behaviour notwithstanding, as living yet just another form of human life. And that wasn't because I was particularly virtuous. It was simply because I saw him in the light of the behaviour towards him shown by my father and by his friend, Hora. 